Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Here with us today we have Eno Tereska. He's going to be giving a talk on enabling what-if explorations in distributed systems. He's a PhD student uh, graduating from Carnegie Mellon where he's been working with Greg Ganger in the Parallel Data Laboratory. Make sure I say that right. Um, and he's been working on basically um, monitoring and um, um, exploring the behavior of uh, uh, systems, in particular cluster-based uh, storage systems. And I'll let him take it from here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, my work on enabling what-if explorations in distributed systems. And I'll start with a bit of a motivation. Can you guys hear me towards? Of course, yeah, it's a small room. Okay. So my, my work has been in the field of system management. Okay, system management because uh, people tell us, companies tell us that they are really high. Uh, often we as humans, we are working for the computers other than the other way around. Okay. In storage systems, I can give you guys some concrete numbers. Uh, people tell us that 60 to 90 percent of the cost for a storage system goes towards managing the system. Here is a graph from Horizon Information Strategies. These are consulting groups okay, that shows that as the cost of hardware has been uh, decreasing over the years, the cost of management has in general been increasing. Now, depending on which consulting group you ask, the crossover point may have happened at some point between 2001 and 2005. Okay. Now, as, as, as computer science people, okay, we have to work on simplifying these management problems, and that's what one of the things I've been doing uh, during uh, my life at CMU. Okay. Now, what exactly are these management challenges and issues? Well, there are a bunch of them. Okay. You have things like data protection, uh, which involves things like backup or mistake recovery, okay. things like capacity planning and acquisitions, uh, things like uh, tuning and load balancing, and also problem diagnosis and healing. Okay. My focus has been on, um, on a broad range of them, actually, uh, on, on, on problems uh, that involve tuning, provisioning, and planning. Each of these problems would greatly benefit from the technology, from the ability uh, to make good predictions. Okay? And, and, and these predictions, however, turn out to be hard uh, for humans to do. Because you can imagine the human sitting outside the system. The human needs to understand the details of how workloads and system resources interact with one another. So my goal has been to make the systems themselves okay, self-predicting. Uh, the, I'm defining self-prediction, small definition, as the ability to answer a, a predefined set of what-if questions. Okay, let me give you some examples. Here we have an administrator. Here we have a cluster-based system, and you have a workload touching this uh, green node. Let's say the administrator bought some rec recently bought some new storage devices. Okay? The administrator would like to know, should I migrate the data to these new storage devices? That's a very simple question. Okay? Ideally, you'd like the answer to this question before you migrate the data, because the migration is expensive. You, know, you can migrate the data and measure it, but you'd like to know it beforehand. Okay? Here's another question. Power turns out to be a huge issue in, in data centers in general. Okay? So you'd like to know, maybe on the weekend, you'd like to turn off 10% of the machines. Okay? You'd like to know what's the effect you know, what, what, what are the trade-offs here between power and performance, for example? Okay? So you can pose it in terms of a what-if question. What happens to throughput of client A if I turn off 10% of the machines on Sunday? Okay? Now, why are these predictions hard for humans? This is a high-level slide here that I'm showing. Okay? Well, fundamentally here, we have distributed heterogeneous systems. Okay? And, you, and you have competing workloads sharing the resource in the system. So what does this mean? Well, the human, this means that the human has to keep track of lots of resources, their capabilities, and also has to understand how different workloads use those resources. Okay? So that's fu why fundamentally this is hard to do for humans. We as system designers, we don't make the, the life of administrators any easier. Okay? We build complex systems with no good notion of, of formal behavior. We don't build systems like we build planes. Okay? We don't really know how the system should behave for a workload. So in practice, what administrators do is that they use rules of thumb. Okay, rules of thumb are things like always replicate three times or try to keep the disk utilization below 30%. Okay, rules of thumb are things that administrators have learned uh, over time. And, and they do work sometimes. Okay, rules of thumb do work, especially in, you know, when you have simple systems and, and, and simple workload configurations. Okay, but in general, in these large-scale systems, rules of thumb don't scale. 
Okay, so we need something else. So the hypothesis of this work, okay, what I'm interested in doing is if there is one thing we can build inside the system, inside the new system, that can make itself predicting, what is that one thing? Okay, so I'm forgetting legacy systems for a while. I'm just saying we're building a system from the beginning. What's the right thing to place inside the system? Okay, so the, the hypothesis is that there is one framework based on, on uh, monitoring, okay, uh, this is going to be end-to-end -end monitoring. We're going to have to monitor everything about requests in the system, or close to everything. And robust modeling that once you build this infrastructure within the system, you can answer a broad range of questions. I'm not just interested in asking a migration question or a power question. I'm interested in asking a whole broad range of these uh, what-if questions, okay? So how, how is, does the structure of this solution uh, look like? Okay, well, the structure of this self-prediction solution uh, has a bunch, has two building blocks that I'm going to talk about. Okay, the first building block is going to be what I call end-to-end -end monitoring. Okay, no surprise here, management requires good measurement tools. Okay, so end-to-end -end monitoring is going to be, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a feasibility study, how well does this work in, in a cluster-based storage system. Okay, the second building block is going to be a bit of an introduction, uh, we have to introduce a bit of formality in the way we're designing the systems, okay? So I'm claiming that every component that you build for a system, whether it's for a hardware, you know, whether it's a disk driver or whether it's, you know, an, an, a, a component that does some sorting, okay, each of these components should have a what-if interface, okay? And, and, and the reality check here is that this, the architecture, the modeling architecture, I'm calling it robust, because the models have to evolve over time and have to take into consideration Things like, you know, the human misconfigured the system. Okay, you have a model for the switch and then the human misconfigures the switch, so then, then what do you do? Okay, so there has to be a strong reality check component into what I'm showing you guys. And then, fundamentally, I'm going to say something different as well here. That Look, these two building blocks are a good step forwards, but are not enough. Okay, we have to design systems to be inherently more predictable to start with. Otherwise, this modeling, yes, is going to predict but if the predictions have a high variance, sometimes they are not meaningful from, a, from an administrator's perspective. So I'm going to go back to this, uh, and, and it's going to be an iterative loop. Okay? Let me give you an example. Here's a simple question. You have a client, you have a, you have a data center, some storage device with some cache and disk, okay? and then you have some load balancers, or, or maybe a database with some CPU and network. It doesn't matter. Okay? The question is, what's going to be the performance of client A if I had another client to the system? client B. Okay, now it turns out that client B competes with some of the resources that client A is using, okay, with some of the CPU and network resources and some of the cache and disk resources. Okay, so part of what I want to do is have the system understand and answer this what-if question by answering a bunch of low-level what-if questions. Okay, for example, what I want to do is have the guy that designs the cache manager provide the cache what-if model as part of it that tells me What's going to be the new hit rate if I put this workflow together? Okay? As part of the guy that, uh, the, of the person that builds the device driver, I want the device driver to have a disk what if module. Okay? That tells me what's going to be the new service time if I put this workflow together. And something similar with the network. Okay? I'm going to call this, eventually in the talk, I'm going to call this expectation based modules. These are going to be based, these models are going to be based, if I'm allowed to preview a bit of what's coming next on queuing theory a bit here, okay? This, these are invariants that should hold in the system because um, the programmer knows how these things should behave if they are put together. Now, hand in hand with this, you also have to have some historical information uh, because sometimes you have to know how has the workload behaved in the past when I've made a change, okay? There are some workloads out there which are adaptive. You change the system, the workload itself changes in unpredictable ways according to the system, okay? So for those, you have to have some historical information so there will be a, a a bit of a statistical slash machine learning component, just don't want to use big words, but uh, for, for, for this part here, that monitors over time and collects some historical information. Are these workloads ever changing and adaptive? Maybe it's best not to predict if that's the case. Ultimately, you want to answer the question with a number, okay, and some confidence associated with it. So A should get 10 megabytes a second and B 50 megabytes a second, and some confidence value associated to this. So in a nutshell, we have this built-in support for, for self-prediction, okay, where we've converted this, the, the, uh, the, the, the problem of, of, of picking the, the, uh, the optimization problem into a problem of picking the best choice uh, among many by asking a set of this, uh, a series of these what-if questions. 
It turns out that this infrastructure is useful for other things like problem diagnosis, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to focus on performance prediction rather than performance anomaly detection in stock. Okay. So this was the motivation. Okay, now I'm going to go a, a, a bit deeper and discuss a concrete problem, data distributions in our cluster-based storage system. And through that problem, I'm going to walk you through the, through the solution uh, building blocks. Okay. Okay, so Ursa Miner is a, is a storage system. It's a data center deployment at CMU. The goal of Ursa Miner is not performance or, or, or scalability. Those are good goals. But the, the goal, the main goal why we got the grant is to understand where are people spending their time managing this system. And, and if you have a solution like the what-if solution, what, how much does it reduce administration time? Okay. Now, apart from management goals, there is one key uh, from a research perspective on the architecture of Versa Miner, there is one key distinguishing factor, and this was presented in the FAST conference. The distinguishing thing about Ursa Miner's architecture is its versatility. Okay, it's a storage system which allows you to, to specialize things about files when they are created and also over time. What are these things? Okay, well, some of these things I placed here. For each file in the system, you can specify something like the data encoding, which means the, the data redundancy style, replication, or erasure coding, for example. Okay? You specify the data placement, where do you want to store the file into this cluster. Okay? Uh, and some more exotic things. Do you assume the system to be synchronous or asynchronous? Or do you assume uh, a fault model? Do you assume crash faults or Byzantine faults in the clients or at the servers? Okay? I'm not going to talk about this last two. I'm going to talk about the first two. And I call data distribution the encoding plus placement. Okay? And the goal here is to answer what if questions to make informed decisions when there, whenever there is time to change from one encoding say to the other. Okay? Let me show you why this is hard for administrators to make. Let's start with encoding. Encoding specifies a degree of data redundancy. Why do you need redundancy? Because things fail. Okay? So, so we're talking about whole server failures in this particular case, but there are different kinds of failures. Okay? And it also specifies the manner in which redundancy is achieved. Uh, in our system we have uh, this for you, those of you that know it, is the, the PACES protocol, and, and we have this general characterization, this M of N characterization, for specifying encoding. Okay? On the right, you write to N storage nodes. Okay? On the read, you just need to read from any M of them to reconstruct the original data. Okay? In addition, uh, to ensure some confidentiality, you may or may not use different kinds of encryption. Let me give you an example. Here's the 3 of 5 erasure coding scheme. Okay? You have a data item. This could be a block of a music file, for example. Okay? On the right, during the encode phase, you create five fragments and you write them to five storage devices. Okay? On the read, you can read from any three of them to reconstruct the original data. Now, three of five tolerates two faults. Okay? Any of two nodes can be down and you can still get your data. W what's another scheme that tolerates two faults? Right, so three-way replication, that's, that's the usual one people think about. And, and in this language, three-way replication, it's a one of three scheme. Okay, on the right, you write to three storage nodes. On the read, you just need to read from one of them to reconstruct the original data. Four of six is another valid scheme. Okay? Now the question is, once you know how many faults you want to tolerate, how do you pick the best of these schemes? And there are a couple of trade-offs here. Okay? In fact, there are many trade-offs that the administrator cannot possibly think about them. Okay? So here's... here's uh, a, a first order look at some of these trade-offs. There are some more involved things as well here, but just uh, a first order look. Okay? As n increases, in general, availability increases. Maybe not linearly because they could have correlated failures, but it generally does increase. Okay? But of course, things like the, CP, the, the network and storage, this is more obvious one, uh, demand also increase. Okay? You have to write data to more storage devices. Okay, so the capacity you're using and the network bandwidth you're using is high, the higher n is on the right, for example. As m increases, all else equal, availability in general decreases. You have to have more storage devices up to reconstruct your original data, and the probability of any of them down increases. Okay? But what the benefit of increasing m is that there is a drastic reduction in the network and storage demand. Okay? This erasure coding schemes, for a block of data, they really transmit over the network n over m. That's how large what's being transmitted over the network is. So if you're using 3 word replication, that's 3 over 1. That's 3. But 3 over 5, it's really 5 over 3. And 5 over 3 is much less than 3. Still tolerating two faults, less network contention and storage uh, 
contention as well. Okay. Here's an easy one. If you're using encryption, confidentiality increases. But at the cost of CPU. Okay, there's a lot of CPU, sometimes an order or, or two magnitude more CPU uh, when you're using encryption. To make things worse, some of these decisions also make depend on the workload. Okay? Maybe if the workload is right most, you want to use erasure coding rather than replication. The administrator needs to understand two things. First one, the first thing is the direction of the arrows. The second is the size of the arrows. That's hard to do. Okay? In addition to encoding, an orthogonal thing is the placement problem. So sure enough, you want to use three or five erasure coding, but which five storage nodes are you going to pick in your cluster? Okay, I lied to you, things don't really look like this. Things look more like this. Okay, even when we're buying things from the same vendor, year after year, servers inevitably are a bit faster. You know, they have more memory, they have faster disks, more CPUs. Okay, so they're heterogeneous machines. And second, these resources are shared by a bunch of workloads, and there is contention in terms of network, buffer cache, and disks. Okay, so the main message here is to do this data distribution questions. Okay? Uh, you have to keep track of hundreds of resources and hundreds of workloads. Okay? So the administrator really cannot do this uh, in practice. Okay? So what we want is answers from the system. So originally I was the one in the system that designed and, and, and built this migration module in Ursa Minor. So migration means that you can take your files, it's a database file for example, a table, and you can convert it from three word application today to three or five uh, erasure coding tomorrow. And you can do this online without impeding client access. Okay? So there's a migration interface that takes you know, two parameters, from and to. What I want to have is a what-if interface. Before I migrate the data, I'd like to know what's going to be the benefit of migrating the data in terms of throughput and response time, for example, as two performance metrics. And then if the benefit is worthwhile, I want to migrate the data. Okay. So this is the, 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 the concrete problem in Ursa Minor. So let's see how these this building blocks work uh, towards solving this problem. Any questions, Mark? So why are we doing this today as opposed to 10 years ago? Okay. This is a this direct consequence of the graph I showed you guys. And, and the, 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 there's not going to be any magic here in terms of uh, what kind of resources are we going to need for this. We're going to throw some hardware at the problem. Okay. So we're going to have dedicated machines doing nothing but making predictions and collecting traces and crunching on them. Okay. So these resources, some of them are going to be part of the servers themselves. You're going to have to have some local activity tracking and local what-if modules. Okay, and then periodically, you send this wealth of information that you're collecting on each individual server into what we call activity databases. These are relational databases. They store these activity records. I'm going to talk about them in a second. Okay? But the nice thing is that you, you, can, you don't have to reinvent another query language. You can just use SQL, for example. Okay? Some of the other machines in the system, we convert them to uh, what we call automation agents. And the high-level what-if question comes to the automation agent, and the automation agent makes use of the wealth of information and local what-if modules to answer it. Let me start talking about the first uh, building block, monitoring. No doubt uh, here that you, that, that you guys know this, that management requires good measurements. Okay? The, the question is, you have a distributed system with a bunch of workloads. Uh, what are the challenges here? Well, the first challenge is that you have to differentiate. The system has to differentiate among workloads. Okay? Performance counters do not work. Performance counters are aggregate. Okay, performance counters, if you have a client that's I.O. bound, another client that's CPU bound, you can't just look at averages. Okay? And furthermore, performance counters have the problem that they are not correlated usually in a distributed setting. Okay? So if the client is complaining at 2 a.m. Okay, and, and you have a multi-tiered system, you have a database in the storage system, and you look at the counter for the CPU at the database, it's high. You look at the counter for the I.O. load at the storage system, it's high. Are they related? Are they related to the problem? Who knows? Okay? So there is this correlation problem that it's, uh, it's, it's worse, especially when you have multiple workloads sharing the resources. Okay? So what we want to do is, is keep track of requests and their sub-requests as they are flowing uh, throughout the system. Okay? And of course, we want to do this efficiently. Okay? We're interested in collecting this efficiently and querying this efficiently as well. Okay? And as I mentioned, one of the goals that we had is, is, is uh, recycling some of the well-known and making this portable so we don't have to uh, build a new query language here. A brief slide on related work, just to put this in context. I have a slide on related work at the end as well, but uh, I don't like keeping everything towards the end. So um, the way I think about systems, I think of them as black box, a bit gray box, if you will, and then white box systems. Okay? If you know nothing about the system, 
that's a black box system. Okay, and the best you can do is uh, what Project Five, and those guys at HP did, HP Labs, is that you sniff packets as they are going through the network, and you kind of build a causal path of how requests flow in the system. The kind of questions you answer, the kind of problems you detect, you can say, for example, look, this whole component is slow. That whole component can be a whole database, however. Okay, so our goal is to really zoom in and, and really get a bit closer to the root cause of the problem. But if there's nothing better you can do, in, if, if you're stuck with the black box system, that's what you do. The second is something what Pinpoint has done. Okay? When you have systems running on top of a well-known middleware layer, and in that case you can instrument the well-known middleware. Okay? Uh, the, 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 the A problem with that is that, again, you don't understand how the applications themselves are behaving. You see the requests coming to the middleware, you don't really know what's happening before them. Okay? We're starting with, a, with we, we want to know, we want to have a feasibility study, what's the best we can do? And then we're going to take the layers off then. Okay? That's why we're closer to, to MakePy, uh, which is at Microsoft. Uh, MakePy basically um, said it can be done and provide this, this event schemas okay, for doing the stitching of requests in, in a system. Uh, our contribution here is really a feasibility study. Okay? Like from how, do, how well does this work in terms of real loads on a cluster-based system? Okay? Talking about you know uh, thousands of requests a second here potentially, and how well can it be queried? Okay, MakePy did not answer the querying question. How can we query this wealth of information? This is just a bit of, of, of related work. There is much more. Okay, so Stardust was our mo is our monitoring infrastructure, and Stardust tracks every client request along its path. Okay, here is a causal path. A request comes in the system. You encode it, and, and, and you have a start and end point. It sends it sent over the network. You have a cache miss, and usually after a cache miss, you may have a disk start okay, event, for example. Okay, part of our contribution has been well, where exactly are we going to place these instrumentation points in this distributed system? And the message here is that you have to place an instrumentation point. It's a bit of a soft message. Okay, you have to place instrumentation points wherever there is significant amount of work being done, whether it's sorting whether you know, that's an algorithmic resource, like you're sorting, it's using some CPU, whether it's the disk resource, you put a, a, a request you know, before uh, the request goes to the disk and one afterwards, okay? or whether it's the network resource, for example. From, from a queuing theory point of view, we're going to have to use some, some queuing here. Okay, so terminology, you have FIFO-like resources. You know, a request comes, has to complete before any other request comes in the system. For those kind of resources, you put a, a, an activity record at the beginning and at the end of the processing. For other resources like processor sharing like resources like the CPU where you can have preemption, multiple requests can be seemingly being processed at the same time, you have to post a record every time there is a context switch, whatever, context, whatever the definition of context switch is okay, in that context. How does this activity record look like? Okay, so again, we're replacing performance counters with these activity records and we're going to eventually store them in database and create virtual performance counters. Okay, so nothing is going to be hard coded in the system. Well, there is the well-known field, the usual suspect, the timestamp. It orders things within a machine. The more important one is really the breadcrumb. We don't have any uh, synchronous assumptions here in, in the system. So the breadcrumb is, can be thought of a logical clock or a request ID. As the request goes from one machine to another machine, the breadcrumb is propagated with it. So, or, or rather, there is a rule for creating a breadcrumb and stitching things together. In addition, there is a payload, and this can be, um, you know, the programmer knows best sometimes what the payload should be like. But Usually the payload is needed for things like trace replay techniques. Okay, I'm going to talk about the buffer cache what if module. And that's based on a bit of a replaying of some of the traces that are being collected. So as requests are flowing in this system, okay, they may create activity at different machines in the system. Here's a simple setup with two machines separated by a network. The first request is breadcrumb one. The rule is that when it goes to another machine, it gets new breadcrumb, it's breadcrumb two. What gets stored in a database in a special table is what we call the stitch record. And the stitch record has two fields, from and to, the breadcrumbs. Okay? This, this stitch record is later going to be used from, uh, when, whenever you use SQL to create the joins so that you get the full uh, request uh, causal path. Okay? Of course, you can have many-to-many -many breadcrumb relationships. Here is a many-to-one. You have small writes. Usually, small writes are called less than one big write before they are sent to disk. Okay, so the breadcrumbs are X, Y, and Z, and the new breadcrumb is one, so you have to stitch them together so that you understand how this many-to-one relationship works like. When it comes to storing and querying the activity records, we choose to, to do some local activity tracking in memory in each of the servers, and then periodically we send them 
to what we call activity databases. Okay, so no performance counters. Every performance counter of interest can be derived using SQL. And the general idea is that you can get the traditional counters that, that uh, give you things like demands okay, or, or service times, you don't usually need joins for them. Okay? But for, if you want to get the latency maps, where are my requests spending time in the system, then you need to do joins across uh, different amounts of tables. Okay? Let me keep this concrete and show you exactly what we're collecting. Okay? So this is a simplified IOPath architecture of Versa Miner. It's a storage system, so you have some storage nodes. Okay? You have metadata service, which keeps track of where the data is stored. And then you can have clients which link to our library and can access storage devices in parallel. Okay? Or clients that don't want to be modified. They make use of well-known protocols like NFS or SIFS. Okay? But then the NFS server has to be modified to talk to the rest of our system. Let me blow this up a bit. Okay? And then you see like, that the disks have some cache and disks, for example. And let me show you where, what kind of traces we're collecting. First, on every server we collect CPU traces. Okay? By the way, this is all, all the code in Ursa Minor is in user land. Okay? We designed everything ourselves, including the file system, for different reasons, uh, which I'm not going to address here. But the, the main takeaway is that from the kernel itself, we didn't need any instrumentation at all, except for context switches. Okay? So every time there is a context switch in the kernel, we keep them and actually we store them in a database. In addition to the context switches that happen in the kernel, every user level context switch we're using state threads, not p threads for those of you who are interested in, in, in the details. Every time there is a state thread context switch, we store the context switch in the database as well. It turns out these context switches make up 70% of the trace data, okay, because it's a lot of them sometimes. But it doesn't matter. Okay, the, the second is buffer cache traces. At every point in the system where there is a cache, we store cache accesses. And this is file system caches, this is not CPU caches. Okay? We store things like you know, file, offset, was it a hit, was it a miss, was it an evict, was it a read ahead, and the breadcrumb. Okay? We store network traces, uh, uh, message level network traces, sender, receiver, breadcrumb, payload, okay? in terms of bytes. We store disk traces. In addition to the seemingly hardware related traces, okay, because they are uh, the device driver of hardware components, we also have traces and entry and exit points of major software modules as well. For example, the NFS server or the metadata server or the whole storage stack. Why? Because whenever you're starting this, to do these what-if questions, you usually are, uh, you want a hierarchical way to look at the system. Okay? So first you start by asking high-level what-if questions. What happens if I double the speed of the whole database? And then the answer using Amdahl's law comes back and says, well, if you double the speed, it's, the system is going to go 20% faster. And then you want to zoom in and say, well, how can I double the speed? Should I buy more CPU? What happens if I buy more CPUs? Should I upgrade the memory and disk and so on and so forth? So you need these instrumentation points at different uh, points in the system to satisfy this hierarchical decomposition of what if questions. What are we talking about in terms of overheads here? Here we have some standard benchmarks, the first four, and then the last one, it's a, it's a scientific workload. And the standard things that the storage system is expected to see, okay, postmark, email, and net news, OLTP is a database workload, okay? IO zone, just sequential reads and writes. Linux built is a development workload. And then QuakeSim, it's, it's, uh, so the, it's, it's, it's an application that uh, simulates the Los Angeles Quake Basin. Okay, so it's a scientific application. And that's not a benchmark, the rest are benchmarks. Okay, so in terms of overheads, we have CPU overhead for the collection. I've taken, you know, uh, there, there are three nodes here, a minimum of three nodes that each of these benchmarks touches in the system. So I've taken the worst case CPU overhead on each of them from collection of these traces online. Okay? This is on at all times. Okay? The performance degradation we've seen, uh, there will be some performance degradation, so there is a trade-off here. Okay? But it has been reasonable. Okay? And I'm not talking about any pruning or anything and any compression. Okay? These are all being stored in a database. These are the full traces on at all times. Now, what's, what's, what is of concern is things like you know, 3.37 megabytes a second of traces coming from one single client, and that's a lot. That's a lot of traces. Okay? So, so the way we operate is that we keep these full traces for two weeks, really for anomaly detection. Okay? And, and uh, we can benefit from uh, what you guys have, like the FDR approach, where you guys uh, have some smart ways of compressing these traces. We don't do any of that at all. Okay? Afterwards, however, after these two weeks, for performance predictions, okay, we do have some pruning techniques. I'm not going to talk much about them, but the main idea here is that 
you have some time windows, and each, for each of those time windows, you just keep a graph of where are requests spending time in their system. You don't need to keep the individual traces that were used to compose to make the graph up. Okay, but I want to show kind of a, 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 a you know unpruned version of how expensive this is, so you guys get a feel for this. Okay, yes. Uh, is the performance degradation with respect to if you turned off the tracing, or if you, in addition, repurposed the activity database machines and the the monitoring? If you repurpose those machines and disks to try to make the benchmark run faster. Uh, no, if, 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 so I don't understand the second point. But uh, I, can, I can tell you that so it's, if you turn off everything off. Is the fact that you've taken these machines that you, in your picture before you, yes. took three of the you took four of the machines, yes. you said, okay. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, is, is the degradation with respect to just turning it off or also, in addition, taking those machines and using them? So we ignore the fact that we can use those machines for good work. So the degradation is only with turning it off. Okay. But that, that's, that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. So how come the overhead is so high there? Like five, five it's very correlated with the uh, original throughput of the application itself. The more requests, uh, ISO, it, ISO uh, uh, has, has a very high throughput uh, from our system. Okay, so it's very correlated to that. The higher, the higher the throughput of the application is, the more traces it's creating. Okay, so in general. Disk I.O. benchmark and you're doing a lot of disk I.O. based? Well, it, it, it depends. Okay, so the configuration is, is in the paper, but it's not fully disk I.O. So a lot of requests, there are a couple of phases in, in, in there is a fully write phase, and then there is an overwrite phase, and then there is a read phase, and then there is a reread phase. So it touches really the cache and the, and the I.O. quite a bit. Okay, so it, it, it. These numbers here, you, you, you just look at them as some examples of a reasonable configuration where a lot of the workload hits in cache, some of it goes to disk with reasonable probabilities. Okay, this is not fully going to disk. Okay, in general, yes. Performance degradation probably, I assume, is referring to throughput. Do you have an understanding of the impact on latency? Uh, so performance degradation is correctly referred to, uh, performance degradation in this benchmark is re referring to whatever metric the benchmarks use. Okay, so these benchmarks use different metrics. So some of them use response time metrics. Okay, postmark for example. Okay, uh, use response time metrics. Uh, uh, it can be used also for throughput, but you know, you really don't want to use postmark for throughput me measurements, okay? So, so, so it depends. The, this is kind of a normalized degradation, but it depends what the application is talking about. So response time and throughput are of concern. And just to give you guys an idea of where is why is there performance degradation? You have to think that often we have this local tracing. Okay, we ship these traces to the databases, and if a foreground request comes now in the system, all of a sudden it's being stuck behind these traces going to the database. So we have some clever network, well, not that clever, the obvious network scheduling, priority scheduling over the network, but even with that, there is some performance degradation. And it's worth mentioning that 70% uh, of the traces are coming from CPU context switches, okay? And there is no compression whatsoever here. So. Just, just some numbers to give this. Uh, um, One more yes. You mentioned way back. I didn't want to interrupt at that time, but I think it's becoming mm -hmm. more, more important now. Is that you assume the disk as a FIFO device? Yes. But in reality, the smarter the disks are, they are not really FIFO devices. They you you batch a whole bunch of things. It actually uh, reorders yes. all of those things. So. Does that have any impact since you have no way of monitoring that kind of activity? That's an excellent question. So that's a, that's a very good point. And, and, and you're bringing something uh, important up that we don't have any access within, to, within the disk itself. So we hook at the device driver. Okay, so if the disk is doing uh, some things within it to reorder requests, then, then we don't have any control over the disk. In our system, we have control over the disk by virtue of doing the scheduling outside the disk. So we don't let the disk queues get larger than two requests. Okay, so the disk cannot order the requests. We do all the scheduling ourselves. Okay, so we don't let the disk do any of that stuff at all. Okay. It's interesting for research purposes, but I think that I, 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 most I, I, of absolutely actually would behave way better if you queued a whole bunch of stuff to them. I agree. I agree. This, I mean, we're, we're a standard, we're, uh, traditionally we're a storage group, and, and I see Bruce here as well. So we do this stuff, and, and, and we've gone to the point where we can do good scheduling outside the disk as well. And I'm going to get to this point later, but this is good prefetching, is that... Uh, some of the things we're looking for is, yes, the disk can do that kind of scheduling itself, but I'm going to introduce a notion of predictability in the system as well. So there's going to be a trade-off between how predictable you want the system to be versus how high-performing you want the system to be as well. So I'm going to touch on that. On that uh, it's, it's, it's related. Thanks for asking the question. 
So the summary of monitoring, again, we, we need good me measurements. I haven't told you exactly yet why we need these measurements, but I'm going to get there. Okay? Uh, this can be added, to, by the way, to legacy systems as well. Uh, I worked, uh, I was an intern at MSR, so we did this at Microsoft SQL Server. Okay, of course, you have to have access to the source code. Okay? And, it, and it took a couple of weeks and a couple of instrumentation points uh, within SQL Server as well. The what-if questions we're trying to answer there is just one what-if question. If we, if we change the amount of buffer cache dedicated to each transaction type, what's going to happen to response time and throughput? Okay? Uh, if I had to pick one remaining challenge in interest of time, I'm just going to talk about the main things here, is can we do this automatically? Okay? Right now, I've inserted the instrumentation in, in Ursa Minor. 80% of it remains static, doesn't change. But if something changes, if somebody introduces a patch in the system okay, that breaks this causal path because they forgot to propagate breadcrumbs across. This doesn't happen most of the cases, but sometimes it can. Okay? I get the headache. I have to go back, check the code, and figure out what that person tried to do. If there is any way to automate this process, if I, if I can run you know, an Oracle database or a SQL Server database, and I can run some magic uh, program that does some binary rewriting, and does some data flow analysis to understand how requests flow through the system, that would be very worthwhile. I don't have an answer for this right now. Okay? Let me talk about the modeling now. Um, what do we want when we talk to, about modeling? Okay, there's been lots of modeling work done throughout the years. Okay, we ourselves have done lots of disk modeling ourselves. So what, 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 what are we trying to do new? Well, what I want to do is introduce some, some formality here in the way we're designing the systems. Okay, so conceptually, I want every person, every module uh, to have a what-if interface. Okay? And this what-if interface should be a first-class citizen in whenever you're building a system. Okay? Um, the main thing here is that you're either going to build robust models, and I'm going to define robust in a second, or the models are going to be useless. Okay? The reality check hit us really hard here is that you can't expect, and, and this is what the, re, the previous work has been done, they, everybody tries to build the best models and then they forget that by the time they deploy it in the system, some things have changed, so the models, the administrators don't have any trust in the system. Okay? So we want these models to be robust, we want them to handle you know, even cases when the administrator misconfigures the system sometimes. Okay? And we, want, we don't want to manage the management architecture. Okay? We want the models to evolve themselves over time. The question, I'm not going to provide an answer that fully evolves them over time. I'm going to provide a semi-automatic answer for evolving these models over time. Okay? But this is extremely important. Otherwise, there is no, the reality hits you really hard. Okay? So, so the related work, you have traditional best models for initial capacity planning. Okay, things like disk sim, Bruce is here. Okay? Our focus is not, we, we don't believe you're going to be able to build the, the best model a priori for whatever you're modeling. Okay? We're not talking just about disks and networks, whatever software component you're modeling. Okay? So we want to have models that evolve over time for continuous capacity planning. Okay? Once the system has been set up and has been observing some workloads, we want the models to apply in those particular cases. So what does this modeling architecture look like? Well, here's a, here's a blank set of boxes. Okay? We have a multi-tiered system. So you have to have a model for each of the tiers. Okay? Um, the models get some runtime observations, and they also get some what-if questions, and they give you some answers. Okay? Now, these models in, in, in our world are going to have two parts. The first part is what I call expectation-based models. Okay? These expectation-based models are things which are based on formal invariance for what should hold true in the system. I'm going to get to them in the next slide. The second part, because I don't believe that uh, system programmers and designers know or can foresee all possible interactions okay, or foresee that the human is screwing up with setting up the system. There is this what I call a bit softer models there, these observation based models which are based on, on historical statistical uh, observations from how the system has been running. So the expectation based models first. Okay, so I'm going to recycle some language from PIP here. Uh, PIP was a paper in NSDI. Okay, so you can talk about the system designer putting within the system an expected structural behavior for how the system should behave. For example, we wrote the decentralized uh, protocol for accessing the data. So something simple is that whenever you're using three-way replication, well, on the right, you're going to contact three storage nodes. There is absolutely no reason why we can't put this invariant within the system whenever we're building the system. Okay? Other things are things like performance behavior. And some of this you want to, uh, most of this you want to detect automatically. Okay? Things like uh, sequential accesses, if your disk reports that the bandwidth is 50 megabytes a second, well, sequential accesses should really be getting 50 megabytes a second. 
or sending 16 kilobytes over 100 megabit per second link should take 1.25 milliseconds. Okay, so these are some simple examples here of, of uh, how the system should be behaving structurally and performance wise. Okay, so in particular for our data distribution changes, because whenever we move data and change the encoding, we're going to touch on a bunch of resources. We have to really, it's been a good test bed because we've had some case studies building models for each of these resources. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them, just uh, give you guys a flavor for two of them. Here's the CPU model. The CPU model takes as a what-if question, what's going to be the CPU demand? Demand service time is the same, okay, it's, it's, it's spreads in seconds, okay? If I use encoding E, encoding E could be replication with encryption, okay? As inputs, you get the, the certain characteristics of the workload, like the read-write ratio. Okay, as output, you get the time to encode and decode a single block. Now, this model is very simple, and I want to show it to you guys because it's very simple. It's based on direct measurements. Okay, as part of the module that does encoding and decoding, we put this cost API. The module simply takes a block, encodes it, decodes it with a hypothetical encoding, and just reports back on the time it took. Okay, why can we do this? Because it's very, it's very cheap to encode and decode a single block. Okay, so this is just a, what I call a model based on direct measurements. Okay. The buffer cache model, on the other hand, is not based on direct measurements. It's based on simulation. Okay, so the, the what-if question that the cache manager should get, okay, that it got, for example, in SQL Server, was what's going to be the workload hit rate if the cache size is X megabytes? Okay, so what you want to do here is collect some, some, some traces as the workload has been running, and by the way, the workloads always are running somewhere. Okay? If you're buying a new system today, the workload has been running on a previous system yesterday. So it's sort of concern, you know, sometimes, well, where are you going to find these initial traces to come up with? In real systems, the workload has been running somewhere for a while. Okay? So what you do is this model, the Stardust, collects these workload traces, and the memory manager, we're telling the person that's building the memory manager for SQL Server or Windows, put it a simulator that it can answer this question. Okay? So I showed you two of them. Now to answer these data distribution questions, we're going to use what's called bottleneck analysis in this particular example. So you have to, you have to ask a whole bunch of what-if questions on all the resources, the CPU, okay, the network, which I didn't show you, which is based on an analytical model, and also the storage, which is made of the buffer cache and the disk model. Okay. What are we using here? We're using queuing theory. Okay. We're not inventing. We're systems people interested in how can we use well-known queuing machine learning laws in real systems. Okay. So queuing theory has been there for 30 years. You know, you have this kind of formulas which give you bounds on throughput and response time. The problem is that, first of all, in a distributed system, we, can, we don't really know what these demands are because we haven't had any good measurement tools. Okay, so part of the contribution here was figuring out what to feed to these queuing models. And there is a second subtle contribution, which I'm going to get in a second. Okay. But, but queuing theory for these expectation-based models, things like mean value analysis and, uh, is used. I'm not, I'm not going to give more formulas than this, by the way. I, I can talk more about this in, in, in person. So why do these things work well? Why have they worked well in practice? And when have they broken? When have they not worked well? Well, programmer knows most of the paths through the system. So there is a reasonable start here on modeling the system. Okay? Turns out that in systems, we're not so much interested in traditional accuracy metrics like root mean squared of the error. In systems, in the kind of problems that we're looking at, we're interested in things like, can I pick the best choice among many? Can I pick the best choice among five? Okay, so the models can be simple and still allow you to do those uh, kind of uh, decisions. Okay? And you didn't hear me talk about any assumptions about workload patterns, things like exponential arrivals or anything like that. We, we don't make those assumptions. This has to work in general. Okay? So, so on the other hand, though, here, here's, here's a big catch. Okay. The big catch is that we had to rethink system, the system design. And this was what I was getting at, for, at this queuing laws. Uh, one, I'm just going to mention one particular thing here. Let's say you're looking at a video, okay, and I'm looking at a video. You're looking at your video sequentially, blocks one, two, three, and I'm looking at the vi my video sequentially, blocks A, B, C. By the time our video requests, which are sequential, arrive at the disk through all the layers, they may appear to the disk as 1A, 2B, 3C, or they may appear as 1, 2A, B in different combinations. So it's not good if you can tell me the prediction is going to be 100 megabytes a second plus minus 70. Okay? Because there is a radical behavior. If the requests are random, uh, have this random pattern at the disk, they're going to get an order of magnitude less performance than if they're sequential. Okay? So the, um, um, a main point that I'm trying to make here is that 
it's not sufficient to have this modeling there. You can't just do it seemingly blindly and, 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 and retrofit it to existing systems. You, we had to guarantee, and this is part of this performance installation, we had to guarantee separability of analysis. Okay? So we had to guarantee that sequential workloads at all layers became sequential, even when they arrived at the disk. So that we don't have to make these predictions with high variance. We have to reduce the inherent pre unpredictability within the system as well. Okay? I, hope, I hope that makes sense. I have a graph about this uh, in, in the evaluation. Okay? So what are the limitations? So we, we deployed this, and, and then um, many predictions can be off. Okay? In many cases, the reality check is that these models um, work well in some cases, but then in, in, in those cases in which uh, you know, the human, uh, for example, misconfigures a switch, or you have a buggy component, okay, the switch is supposed to give you from the models 100 megabytes a second. It's only giving you 2 megabytes a second. Well, why? Okay? And there is also the other reality check that we have experienced ourselves. We're not perfect model designers. Okay? In fact, we don't want to be. We want to be as cheap as possible so that the system cost is, is reduced. Okay? So the models sometimes are limited or incorrect. They haven't, they haven't foreseen all possible workload system interactions. Okay? So some concrete examples here. I mentioned the switches. Then we had this CPU. Uh, we had this uh, guy that did the scientific workload. They were using some weird block sizes. In storage, we use usually eight to 32 kilobytes, those, those are considered reasonable block sizes, and he was using a half a K block size. Okay? And all of a sudden, the TCP stack within the kernel starts consuming a lot of CPU if you have small block sizes. Okay? So our model didn't, didn't foresee that beforehand. I, you know, I wrote the model, I didn't think of that beforehand. Maybe other people would have thought about it. Okay? And then we upgraded the Linux kernel from 2.4 to 2.6, and then all predictions were off. Okay? So th this, this is the reality check here. Okay? So, uh, what we're going to do is use the observation-based models to, to, to start addressing these kind of issues. Okay? So what we want, if, if there is you know, a, a definition of robust models, robust models should do a couple of things. First, uh, they should pinpoint whenever a human misconfigures something and whenever there is something wrong in parts of the components in the system. Together with predicting, they should also pinpoint what the problem could be. So you have a reasonable start into looking at the problem. Okay. Over time, this will suggest new monitoring and also refine their predictions over time and give you confidence with the prediction as well, not just an average uh, uh, value. Okay. So let, let me just zoom in into two of these properties, the self-checking and evolution. In Ursa Minor, we have models all over the place. So in addition to these models predicting, every time somebody complains, each of the models self-checks and says, well, uh, if the client is complaining at 2 a.m., the CPU model says, well, everything looks fine with me. It consumed as many resources as I predicted it would consume. Okay, and so on and so forth. And then one of the models raises a flag and says, I predicted one millisecond. It really took three. Okay, so zoom in your attention over here. Over time, so that's one of the properties. The other property is that you want, we don't believe system designers, we believe system designers know, in general, what matters. Okay, they just don't know the exact strength of the correlation for how something matters with the eventual performance. So we want the system to incorporate new attributes inside these models as well. Okay? So this is the last slide before the evaluation. Okay? So the observation-based models are, are uh, we make use of a well-known machine learning tool called CART, classification and regression trees, and we put a Z in front of it. We call it Z-CART because we don't need any training data to, to get up to, to, to create the initial machine learning model. Okay, because we, the initial model is going to be based on our expectations. Think of base nets. The biggest problem with base nets is that how do you come up with the initial structure of the base nets? Okay, after you've come up with structure, you can come up with the probabilities using the observation. But to come up with the initial structure, you need some domain knowledge. In our case, the domain knowledge is the expectation-based models. That's why they go hand in hand. Okay? So, so uh, let, let me just show you here some examples on how these models are expected to work. Okay? Uh, I mentioned some of these examples with the switch. There is a problem when, whenever you're using a large amount of nodes to store your data onto. It's called the TCP influx problem, by the way. Whenever you're using small blocks, and then whenever you're changing the kernel number. Well, what we want the models to do is pick on these new attributes. Okay? So the learning model should pick on things like large amount of nodes, small blocks, and maybe even the number 2.6. Okay? In fact, our, our, our current model for predicting behavior has a split if it's 2.4 versus 2.6. Okay, that, 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 that's a, a good enough start for how the model should be here. Okay, any questions before I move on to the evaluation? Okay, 
So the evaluation is going to do two things. Uh, I'm just going to give you um, the main ideas here. Okay, so the, the I'm going to talk about the automation agents, what if questions. Okay, and then I'm going to show about how we evolved just one of the models, the CPU model, since I started with that. I'm just going to use a synthetic works workload here because it gives freedom of changing a couple of parameters. Okay, and only this particular encodings, one of three, and three of five, and one of one. Here's the first question. This is a question banks have. Today I'm using three-way replication. Tomorrow I want to encrypt my data. Okay, what's going to happen to my performance? So it's a very simple question. We want the system to answer this question, not the, not, not the bank administrators. Okay? On the x-axis you have a characteristic of the workload, the percentage of reads. Okay, it turns out that it's going to matter. On the y-axis is the throughput in terms of megabytes a second. In green is one of three, three-way replication. In orange is three-way replication with encryption. Okay? Dash is predicted, solid is measured. This is going to be a game, this particular workload, I'm just going to focus on two resources, the CPU and the network. I'm assuming it hits in cache on the storage devices. Okay? So to answer this high level question, you have to answer two questions. First of all, if I encrypt my data, what's going to be, is the, what's going to be the CPU demand? And second of all, what's going to be the network demand for this particular read-write ratio of the workload? Okay? A couple of trends here. Uh, first of all, the prediction accuracies are reasonable. Okay? Second of all, uh, if you're using encryption, you're going to be CPU bound. Okay, so no matter what the workload looks like, you're not going to get more than 25 or so megabytes a second. Okay, on the other hand, if you're not going to use encryption, it's really going to depend on the workload. If we're having a, by the way, zero means, I don't know if I explained it, all writes. Okay, 100 means all reads. If we're using writes, the network is a, is a gigabit network. So you have to divide by three the real throughput that's going through the system when you're using three-way replication. Okay, so you're not going to get more than that over there. If it's all reads, on the other hand, you can actually uh, fill, you can make the bottleneck uh, be the network itself. Okay, but the main thing here is that the system itself should provide, depending uh, on the observations of the workload, and inherent characteristics about what it knows about each of these encodings, should provide the answer. Here's a, a question that. Um, is going to link back uh, uh, to the predictability case. What happens if I had a workload? So you have the first workload using three-way replication, all reads. It's sitting in cache. It's happy. Okay. Now you want to add another workload to the system. It's also sequential, but not accessing the same amount of blocks. So the the, the predict is there. So initially, you know, this question involves you know predicting the the cache behavior, asking the the buffer cache model what happens if I add another workload, and then the disk model. What happens if I had another workload as well? So this is the question. This is the problem I was, I was telling you guys before. Okay, is that depending on how these requests are interleaved, you have a large variance on how they behave. And then the question is, what do you want me to predict? Okay, and what people usually do in this case is that they give you worst case predictions. Worst case predictions are not very satisfying, especially for the disk where there is a large, there is a large discrepancy between worst case, average case, and best case. Okay, sometimes by an order of magnitude. Okay. So this is not enough. This is what we originally had uh, when we just put the models on top of the existing system. And then we had to change the system to make this uh, more reasonable. Okay, and performance installation, the main idea here is that it, it leads to simpler models. If you can, if you can guarantee, okay, here, here's the problem here. I had workload one. By the time I had workload two, I don't want to redo the prediction for workload one. Okay, I want the interaction of the two to be predictable. Okay, this in turn leads to simpler models and more meaningful predictions. So what we had here is we converted a worst case to average case behavior. Basically, performance improved and it was more predictable. We didn't need to do the plus minus uh, deal. Okay. Let me show you how we evolved the CPU model using Zcard. Okay. Uh, the initial model is a decision tree. Okay. And, and the nodes in the decision tree are things like, well, are we using encryption? Yes or no. Okay. Are we using, what kind of encoding are we using? Okay. And the initial decision tree is based on the expectation-based models. We didn't need any training data to come up with the initial structure. Okay? But it turns out that block size also matters, and it turns out that I did not think about that. Okay? It's, a, it's a simple example. Maybe I should have thought about it, but I did not. Okay? So that's the reality. So what we want is that the system, by the way, Stardust, with all that monitoring we're doing, it's giving us a very rich attribute pool to select from. Okay? All those characteristics of the workloads in the system are there. So over time, this decision tree now starts collecting samples and, and, and confidence values and says, look, if the block size is less than 3 kilobytes, your predictions are going to be 72% worse than what you originally predicted. Okay? And 
ultimately over time it generalizes over a set of servers. Okay, so you don't want to, to build a decision tree for every CPU. You want it to generalize over the same CPU type, for example. Okay? So the improvement in accuracy, here, here's the main takeaway. Okay? These machine learning models, they find the nonlinear behaviors in the system which you haven't thought about. So originally we had this straight line as the prediction. And the machine learning, the, 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 the CART model found the nonlinear behavior depending on block size. I'm going to conclude here. Um, so the ability to predict the consequence of a change, uh, we believe it's, it's important if we're starting to build predictable, uh, more uh, manageable systems. And the building blocks are this end-to-end -end activity tracking, okay, and this robust modeling infrastructure. It is early experience. These are first steps. They can be extended in, in a couple of ways. Okay. Uh, uh, many areas benefit from this what-if approach. Things like, I just looked at performance in this particular case. The customer, you have to also start thinking about business goals. Okay. The customer has a certain amount of money that their data is worth it. Okay. They have to think, you have to think about picking the best choice you know, and you have to trade off power with performance. For example, fewer application and 305, okay, they both tolerate two faults, so availability, you know, first order, they both tolerate two faults, different performance curves, and also different power curves. Okay? For the first one, you have to have three machines on. For the second one, you have to have five machines on. Maybe with five machines on, you can serve more work. Let's say. Okay? So there are these issues which, ideally, you'd like to combine all these metrics, and ideally, you'd like to extend this what-if approach to all of them. Okay? And I think that's very important. And then there is the long-term evaluation of the human factor. Uh, how smart do administrators have to be to ask the right what-if questions? Okay. Uh, I talked a lot about administrators here, by the way, just to keep it simple. But ideally, we'd like this administrator to be within the system itself. Okay. So the administrator is really within the system. Okay. But it turns out that we've talked to different comp companies. And the reality check is the existing administrators need to get some trust from the system. So you have to export some simple what-if interface so that they play and they they can verify what they know. Okay? So, so, so the long-term evaluation is important here from a computer, human-computer interaction point of view. And then, uh, you know, on this area of building inherently more predictable systems, you know, uh, uh, the main thing that, that interests me is, is, is there a predictability metric? Okay? I, I, I don't know right now. Okay? So, so I talked about this. It's probably going to depend. Okay? But I talked about the sequential workloads, maybe low entropy, becoming random access, maybe high entropy. Is there something I can run on an algorithm that tells me how predictable, whatever that means for that particular algorithm, how predictable the system is? Okay, so, so I, I'm thinking about this. I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, where. I'm just hoping to collect some case studies to, to start thinking about this in general. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I gave some related work as I was walking through the talk, so I'm uh, going to take any final questions at this point. Yes. So temporarily, we have 20, currently 20 megabytes, of sec, uh, 20 megabytes of buffer cache on every machine is dedicated to traces. Then we ship them to the uh, uh, periodic to the activity databases. But that's online while the workload is going. While the workload is stopping the workload. No, 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 no. Yeah. There has to be some network scheduling so that you don't interfere too much with the workload. Yeah. I said about, I mean, so you talked about changing the, the system itself to make it more predictable. Yes. Um, what were the types of changes that you ended up making? You mentioned the one with the, the, the interleaving of the video blocks yes. and things, but um, were all the changes you made kind of specific to the particular part of the system you were touching? Or was there kind of, you know, general, I don't know, yeah, yeah. Thumb or something that yeah. that's a good question. So, so, so the, the, actually the performance installation is a general problem. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a general problem today. Virtual machines, for example, have been provided as one answer, but virtual machines don't isolate storage. Okay? Virtual machines are good for isolating the CPU. So uh, the problem with isolating, insulating workloads from one another in storage was an open problem in general. So it does apply to, to storage in particular, but it's still large enough that you know, it, 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 it warrants a paper, for example. Right? The other things, I can give you two more concrete examples, which are more sim uh, simpler in a way. Uh, things like modifying the system so that we could avoid read, modify, writes as much as possible. Okay? The application block size in our system, and this is in the, in the FAST paper about Ursa Minor, we can match the application block size to the inherent way we're storing the block size on storage. 
Okay, that simplifies the behavior somewhat because whenever you're looking at these graphs, by the way, these this graphs, these causal graphs, it's very complicated. If, we, if you have this read, modify, write behavior, you really don't know what you're looking at. Okay, so if you can avoid that whenever possible, that's great. A third example uh, uh, to make performance a bit more predictable in our system, and this is something which is well known but it's worth pointing out, is we use LFS, we, we use a log structure file system uh, as, as the back end, and that has turned out to be uh, our system sees a lot of writes, and so from the perspective of the disk, we see lots of writes, and this is what usually uh, clusters see, storage clusters see. By doing that, we have converted the performance of random access writes to the performance of sequential writes. Okay, so that's a simplification in, in how my model should be for writes now. One less thing to worry about. Okay, so these are some concrete things uh, that that uh, we had to redo. Uh, yes. Okay. I didn't hear you say much about correlating the tracing, but you mentioned it in one of the early slides. Yes. It's that using timestamp is a trivial task to correlate. <coughs> so the, the question is, I didn't hear you talk about correlation of traces. You didn't hear me talking about correlation because we, don't, we, we, co we have the correlation done explicitly. We have the full causal path. We don't, want, we, we don't do any correlation, really, of traces because we know exactly what, perform, what, what traces relate to another trace on another machine because we propagate these request IDs with the requests as they go through the machines. So think, th think about it with, as, as no, cor no statistical correlation of, of counters. Think about it as, as real knowledge of the caus causal path of requests in the system. Okay? Uh, just to add just one thing to it. Correlation, uh, there has been some related work on correlating statistics in a distributed setting. Okay? Um, I believe, was it uh, from um, some folks at HP as well, and I think you guys have also looked at it. A big problem is that if you have multiple workloads, okay, it's a problem doing the correlation because you have, uh, in, from our point of view, from what we saw, is we have a lot of false positives. It's not just one workload running in the system. It's a couple of them. So you have to understand really how each workload accesses each resource. And the correlation, more chances of getting false positives. Hard in practice, okay, to, to really sort those out. Yes? Questions on the breadcrumb stuff. Yes. So, the, so if I understood it right, you were gentle. Uh, the front end machine generated a breadcrumb and then back end generated a new one for each request. Yes. So who knew enough to be able to stitch to say this was the request from the two breadcrumbs together? Oh I, I did. I did. So I, I was so so the question is how do you know where to st how to stitch breadcrumbs? Uh, you, you you have this many to many relationship. So you have a thread working on one request and then another thread picks it up, starts working on it, or one request gets splits off multiple requests. I had to go through the code uh, and, 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 and find out those places in the system. That's why there are 200 instrumentation points inside the system. So it, it did take effort. It's possible to do, we did this in SQL Server as well, so it's worthwhile the effort. The open question is can we do this automatically, for example. But, if you, but that is, you knew that on the single machine, right? So if your front-end machine was talking to a SQL server. I want to make sure that this web request was what caused that code procedure call. I, I, knew it, I knew it on a service level, not necessarily on a machine level. I knew it how services interact with one another. Okay, I knew that the, the metadata service okay, is going to access the storage devices if it misses in cache, for example. Okay, so those kind of interactions, I knew them. Okay, for, but from, from a software perspective, not, not from a, the physical machine's perspective, in a way. Does it make sense? But you're actually not shipping the breadcrumbs along with the request itself. In, 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 in some cases, yes. So, so that's, that's a good question. The question is how are breadcrumbs, and I didn't touch upon this, how are breadcrumbs propagated to the system? Within a single machine, within a single service, service is better than machine, breadcrumbs are propagated through, uh, we have state threads, okay, these are user level threads, and they all have a private da data structures, and the breadcrumb is part of that, so we don't need to change the APIs at all. Okay, one thread does work, the breadcrumb is part of the thread. Whenever another thread in the same machine takes over, the breadcrumb has to be passed over whenever there is a context switch. So there has to be an instrumentation point at the context switch level. Now, whenever you have asynchronous requests, a request hits in cache and then later on is sent to disk, or whenever you have requests that go through the network, part of the RPC through the network, for example, has to take the breadcrumb. Okay, and part of the request in the cache has to have the breadcrumb as well. So that means that if you had standard protocols or things, we would because they don't pass those breadcrumbs along. It would be hard for us to go across 
you know, some web service interface or a ODP PC connection or something to be able to tie that across, right? So, so is it difficult to do with legacy components? There are two answers to this I can think of. I agree. So we're using TCP ourselves as well. So we have our own messaging layer on top of TCP. We enabled us to do this. Okay, so that's one answer. The other answer is that if you really think about it, what's, what this is giving us is, is efficiency in joins. There is no reason really why you, can use, why you should use one, one breadcrumb. What you can do is have these virtual breadcrumbs. Let's say you're a database and let's say I'm a storage system. Okay? I'm accessing table from the perspective of the database. I'm SQL Server and I'm EMC. I have no idea uh, there is a standard read-write interface. We don't talk to one another otherwise. You are accessing, the last trace I get from you is table foo, offset 3, I'm doing a read. The first trace I get here is also the file name foo, offset 3. Okay, so there are these virtual breadcrumbs that you can use to link things together in legacy systems as well. That doesn't make any sense? So you don't need, uh, but, but then when it comes to querying, whenever it comes time to join this, you have to do joins on multiple fields, so there is a performance in there as well. But in a synchronous system, if, you, if you're making synchrony assumptions, okay, it's possible to do the stitching with reasonable degrees of accuracy, even if you don't have the breadcrumb. Okay. Other question? Uh, so you mentioned that uh, there's what if uh, questions are uh, first class entities in uh, yes. system, right? That's your hypothesis. So for subsets of these what if questions, can we identify certain operations that we can perform on those questions? I don't know if this is a relevant question. But uh, as a system designer, I can answer uh, these what if questions only to, certain, uh, to a certain degree, right? As yes. to an abstraction level. But as I start combining these different components and to make a larger system, it's really hard for me to uh, start uh, answering these what if questions. So can you integrate these? What if questions at the lower level and answer higher level questions? So there, there, are, there are tiers of what if questions, right? So, so, so that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. Where, where do you start and is there a structured way to answer these what if questions? A couple of answers. First of all, there is no, no language processing here. The way we, we think by language processing, I mean you're not going to be able to make up any new what if questions and the system is going to figure out, well, how does it translate? We, the, the, we envision the system shipping with a couple of hard-coded what if questions. Okay, so hard coded what if question, what happens if I had a workload, for example? Okay, so that's, that's the first answer. Okay, the second answer is that yes, there is a tier there. So once you ask one of these hard coded what if questions, it knows what kind of low level what if questions to ask. So for example, when I asked the question, what happens if I had a workload, it had to ask the network, the buffer cache, and the disk what if question, uh, low level modules as well. Okay, but this is hard coded. We don't know how to do it so that you can ask any arbitrary questions and convert it to, to uh, to this uh, low-level modules. I think that's actually a, a reasonable point to, to add for, for uh, remaining challenges, which I didn't add here. Right. Any other questions? No, no, please. Exactly that's what, what I'm here for. How long are you going for? Um, we have the room until, until noon. Next next point. Next so one other question is, if you wanted to ask a new word of question, and the sort of tool work, right? You have to build the models around those things and yes. you have to add the instrumentation. Um, the hard work for us usually mostly is to try to figure out what instrumentation is needed and yes. put that in. That's a long lead time kind yes. of work for us, right? So how much work can be done to sort of say, if you're asking this question, can you tell us that this instrumentation is missing? Yes. Right? And how, well, how much of that is algorithmic versus somebody having to stare at somebody else's model? Yeah. So, so, so the, the, the question, the question is, 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 is a bit complicated in that it has multiple interpretations in a way. But the way, the way I think about this is that, first of all, the questions, the setup I provided here, that kind of monitoring I provided here, turns out to be good enough for a really broad range of performance-related what-if questions. Okay, so for performance-related what-if questions, all you need to do is have the instrumentation I'm showing you there as, as case studies. Okay. Now, if I if I had to answer, if I had to ask, say, a question about you know, uh, at the database query planner, I want to put a what if interface there. I don't think there is any magic here. I think somebody, the person, the philosophy here is that if you're building the query planner, you should you should you should be exporting some what if interface that you think are important in release one, in release two, the customer maybe gives you feedback on on what else to add and you incorporate them in release two as well, for example. So. No magic there. I think the people that are doing these components need to be thinking a bit about what kind of what-if questions. They need to be thinking a bit about how predictable the system is and how easy is it to manage. And part of it is, is defining the what-if questions they think administrators may ask. 
it's, it's, it, it's not zero cost to the system designer. Okay, and the system designer will have to think about uh, predictability and management. And up to now, the system designer has been thinking more about building a driver for the specifications, just for getting the bytes across, for example. Okay. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.